As you know from your program, I could have said a lot more about Anthony Lupo, and, and um, I introduced him, you, him to you uh, with very little said because his reputation precedes him. Well, good afternoon, and I thank the Heartland for inviting me to come here and speak today. And let me get set up with my PowerPoint. And it's quite an honor to follow a scientist like Bill Gray. And a minute ago, he, uh, he asked me, uh, am I supposed to be sitting here? And, I and he said, I think they mistaked you for me. And I said, no, I'm, I'm a little shorter than you are. So. <laughs> but it is an honor to follow Bill Gray. And uh, uh, again, thanks, John, for your introduction. And you could have just introduced me, certainly, as the meteorologist who can't make a forecast. So, <laughs> Well, uh, I'm going to talk uh, in a little different terms. Uh, I'm going to give a little background, because my job here was to talk about extreme events. And that's a fairly broad topic. So I'm going to talk about that from the um, Oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about this from my own little corner of the world in research, and we've been looking at tropical cyclones and the 2010 Russian drought, which was caused by blocking events, something I've done a lot of research on. And then I'm going to briefly introduce March 2012, which was extremely warm over the continental United States, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, extreme events. What are these things? And if you, uh, if you define extreme events from the temperature and precipitation perspective, you look at these things as statistical occurrences that are way out in the tails of a distribution. If it's temperature or if it's precipitation, you could define this using a, a return period statistic, or you can certainly look at these things in terms of record-setting events. Or you can look at these things as events that cause human casualties, uh, like tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, things that are usually thought of as quiet, like high pressures and blocking, can be considered extreme events, as we're going to see. And if you remember, last year, uh, one of these statistics was thrown out. The USA suffered from 14 one billion dollar disasters. Boy, what a headline grabber, huh? And usually in statistics, uh, we like to torture the data, but this is one statistic that was curiously left alone. Uh, and of course, uh, these are often cited uh, by many, including James Hansen, who said in his editorial that was shown earlier today that this Russian drought of 2010 was definitely caused by blocking. And it's something that, or I'm sorry, global warming, and it's something that we're not observing in the uh, modern human era. Of course, uh, my interest in this is at the state of Missouri. My home state was affected by two of these events. We got more than our share of trouble in uh, 2011. The Missouri River flooded and uh, affected the northwest and southeast corner of our states dramatically, uh, affected farming, economics, flooded the roads and disrupted transportation. And then, of course, there was the Joplin tornado, which was a disaster unto itself. Of course, the U I don't want to focus this just on the United States. There was severe weather elsewhere during uh, 2011 and into 2012. And this was mostly on the cold side of the ledger, the extreme cold that we saw in Eastern Europe and uh, Western uh, Russia and Alaska, record-setting cold for much of the winter. Well, you, you can't describe any one cause to extreme events. Um, one can certainly say that maybe these things are the result of uh, very strong atmospheric forcing in the right place at the right time uh, to create these events. And like I had mentioned earlier, maybe the prolonged occurrence of something that is usually more benign, okay, maybe like a, a rain event, 
that stays over an area for days and days. Okay. Is extreme storminess caused by global warming? We hear this all the time. Well, the answer, as Bill said, is obviously not. The general circulation, the job of the general circulation, if you will, is to redistribute heat, momentum, and moisture from areas where there's a surplus of these quantities, i.e. the equatorial regions and the polar regions. And there's my geek moment here as I put in <laughs> something that I torture my students with in my Gen Cert class. That's the momentum budget. But it, uh, really, that was just there to remind me to speak on the job of the general circulation and not mess it up. Okay, we know that, or we hear that the anthropogenic climate change is going to warm up the polar regions much faster. And of course, we know about this upper tropospheric hotspot that is talked about in papers like Ben Sanders, which by the way, his 2009 paper was garbage. You should look at it. Ugh. He takes a common textbook statistic and just messes it up and makes it show his point. So bad, bad math. Okay, uh, if, if you warm up the polar regions faster relative to the equator, these principles tell us and these equations tell us that you'll slow down the general circulation. You'll decrease the storminess. We know that. Also, if you heat the upper troposphere faster than the lower troposphere, what are you doing? All right, you're making the air more stable from a meteorological perspective. And of course, that would make extreme storms less likely. All right, so if global warming is going to occur like they say it's going to occur, it certainly is better for extreme events. I'm going to talk a little bit about tropical cyclones because our next guest is also going to do that. But we would also looked at these because there's a lot of contention that those are causing uh, increased uh, extreme events. And we looked at tropical cyclones in all five basins minus the uh, southern Atlantic. We subdivided that into 18 sub-basins. We looked at trends. We looked at ENSO variability. We looked at variability with respect to the PDO and then overlapped them. And the basic message was this. We did find some trends. All right, we found a trend in the Atlantic region that was upward, but it's insignificant. If you look at the trend in the B plot, that was tropical storms only, and they went up at a statistically significant rate. But in the East Pacific, the trends went downwards. All right, and if you add these up globally, these ups and downs kind of canceled out, and you got virtually no trend. Now, I, I think that tropical storms increased for much the same reasons that F1 and F0 tornadoes increased. We just have better ways of looking at them or sensing them. If you look at global tropical cyclone frequencies over the decades, not much change between the 70s and 2009, although there's a little bit of an indication of a drop. And of course, uh, there were more tropical cyclones uh, later, or tropical storms later, and more cat threes through fives but again, I think that's just due to better observation techniques. Now let's move on to the Russian drought real quick. And the hot temperatures of 2010, of course, set many records. And of course, the Russian people suffered uh, quite a bit. Now I work with the scientists at the Russian Academy and at the University of Belgorod, and we're examining the pro pro problem of Russian drought. And it seems to be that Russian drought is caused by prolonged blocking. Many of you don't hear about blocking because it's not a sexy topic in meteorology. But blocking is basically a prolonged ridge, stationary ridge in the jet stream that lasts about 10 days. It generally occurs over the oceans and gives forecasters a headache. Well, these blocking events persisted from May into August. 
And I've got on the right-hand side there a picture of the uh, northern hemisphere circulation. You can kind of see the blocking pattern in the upper left-hand corner. It, it appears, if I had a pointer, I could show you better. But strong, long-lived blocks all right, are more typical of winter. And James Hansen says, well, this was caused by CO2 and warming. Well, if it was, this blocking event should have looked more like a summertime event, which is dominated by large-scale processes relative to smaller-scale processes. Okay. These blocking events were very strong and very long-lived, and typically warm-season blocking events do not last very long and are not very strong. Okay, so what was contributing to these events? Well, we, we developed a new diagnostic, I, I say we, my research group, based on the uh, center point pressure of the blocking event. And we were able to determine the relative contribution of planetary to synaptic scale. And when we used that on the July 2010 event, all right, the bottom graph shows that the synoptic scale was above the baseline value that we take for our index for most of the month. In other words, small-scale processes were feeding this event much like a wintertime event. And if warming was causing this, we would expect that to behave more like a summer event with the dominance of the large scale. Okay, let me just mar uh, introduce March 2012. Our research group became interested in this because Missouri was 8.5 degrees above normal in Celsius, about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And, of course, the local and regional media were all over this. Oh, my God, this is what our future looks like. This is global warming. It's global warming on steroids. It's... Uh, it's, we've never seen anything like it. Of course we haven't. This was a record March event. But was it the record event of all time, even in our short 120-year period? No, we looked at all months, and we showed that December 1889 was actually further above its normal than March 2012. And, of course, back in 1889, we weren't so worried about driving those SUVs around. Well, we're looking, again, this is something that's going to keep my students busy for a while, but uh, March 2012 just appears to be a perfect storm of events. The preceding winter months were very dry, the previous four months. That sets the stage for, uh, uh, of course, for the warming. And, of course, the warm winter did us no favors because that increased evaporation above the normals as well. La Nina pattern with a very strong positive Arctic oscillation and then strong ridging over central North America. This was a recipe for a very summer-like pattern, even in March. And we've done an initial comparison of March 2012 versus December 1889. And there seems to be a lot of similarities, especially if you look day by day at the events. But here's a monthly average of the events. And December 1889, of course, is reconstructed. But you can see cold, cold air uh, in the north bottled up in both cases and a very strong ridging over the continental United States. The 564 line even getting into Chicago in this diagram. Oops, going backwards. All right, so to wrap it up, if we're going to use tropical cyclones or tornadoes as an example, there's very little evidence that uh, climate change is causing these things to increase. All right. And, of course, droughts have occurred, and they will occur. Just ask those folks in Texas. All right, John will tell you. Talk to my wife. <laughs> and, of course, if you look back in Texas's history, the droughts of the 50s were just as bad as the ones today. So these things are occurring again and again. And even with the Joplin tornado, 
All right, even with the Joplin tornado in Tuscaloosa, two cities ravaged in one year, it happened in 1936, Tupelo and Gainesville. And I think that's where I'll end it. Thank you.